I thought it would be fun today since this is, well, you at home are probably watching this later, unless you're doing something funny I don't know about. Um, today's gonna be the last day the St. Louis Rams will play in St. Louis, ever, in my lifetime anyway. So we, I thought I would show a world championship that had some games played in St. Louis, okay? And I was thinking, wow, it's really strange that a world championship match could be played in more than one city. And then I realized in 1990, pretty recent, uh, Karpov and Kasparov played in two cities. So maybe it's not so strange. Uh, they played in New York and Lyon. And this world championship match in 1886 Considered the first official one by most people, some think you can go further back, um, was between Steinitz and Zuckertort, which was played in New York, and then St. Louis, and then New Orleans. And this match has two pretty reasonable reasons why it's considered the first world championship match. One is, if this match was played earlier between basically any two people, you could pretty easily argue that Morphy was better than them. Um, that would be difficult to argue now due to Morphe not being alive. So uh, with Morphe, Morphe's death and the fact that there was a double round robin tournament held previously uh, in 1883 uh, with eight of the best players in the world, uh, I'm sorry, 14 of the best players in the world, double round robin, 26 games. And Zucker tore one with 22 points um, and I think Steinitz got something like 18 and a half. Uh, so those were probably the two best players in the world based on that criteria, and it took them a little while to get a match going, and they did. Now one confusing thing about this picture of Zuckertort and Steinitz playing in New Orleans um, is there's no chess clock, and I did some investigation and they, they played with the chess clock. So I um, guess whoever drew that picture. Um, uh, they played a strange time control, like 30 moves in two hours, then 15 moves per hour. Um, now the match started a very strange way. Steinitz won the first game, which is what we're gonna look at today. And then Zuckertort won the next four games. And then they, Steinitz was coming back, win, draw, win, draw, win, draw. He came back, he was leading by one point in New Orleans, and then in the last five games, Steinitz scored four and a half out of five, and the match ended because the match was the first to win 10 games, and he won 10 games to five with five draws. So after game five, Zuckertor really got crushed, because Zuckertor was up four games to one after game five, and then it was all downhill. Okay, so I wanted to look at this game because this was the first game ever played in a world championship. So pretty cool. Uh, Steins was black, and uh, the notes are pretty funny, because some of the notes are by players from back then, and some of the notes are by more reasonable people. So, okay, so they played a Slav. Then World Championship hasn't changed since the first one. They play this now. And after E3, um, which is not played now, but you, you would see Knight F3 and E3 or Knight C3 and E3. Um, he played the move Bishop F5, which you probably wouldn't see here, but I think it's okay. Um, in positions where it goes knight f3, knight f6, e3, bishop f5 is common. Okay, so bishop f5 is okay. And this is a very interesting game. I think um, the eighth game was the, the one everybody likes. But this game is very interesting because uh, basically Steinitz played all on the king's side and Zuckertor played all on the queen's side. And um, well, it was a, sort of fun game to watch, maybe not to play. Okay, so. White played knight c3, although usually when we see really early bishop f5, we, the way to try to refute it is to trade on d5 and play queen b3, and we're threatening the pawn on b7, and if the queen tries to defend somehow, then the d5 pawn is hanging. b6 is the kind of move that I like to face when I'm white. And the recommendation, of course, was bishop c8, which actually I agree with. So that's the way to try to punish bishop f5. But white played knight c3, e6, and we actually just get some normal looking position that you could see in a world championship today. Now in this position, um, if black had played knight f6, which would transpose to a very common position, white likes to play knight h4 and try to get rid of this bishop. And sometimes black is like, take my bishop, 
and sometimes black tries to run away. Um, but, but sign has played knight to d7, so now knight h4 is less good because it's hanging. So, yeah, it's not easy for white to play a move here because this is a very nice bishop. I would say that black is already just about equalized. Probably grandmaster today would play bishop to d3 and just trade the bishops. But, okay, white played a3, which is, I mean, not terrible. So, uh, bishop d6. <laughs> this move is given an exclamation mark because it says it entices white to play c5. So that's the kind of annotations we had 130 years ago. Um, okay, bishop d6 is fine. Now, again, grandmasters today wouldn't play c5 because it gives away the, the attack on the d5 pawn. What black wants to do over the next seven or eight moves is either play c5 or e5. Since black has played c6, it's more likely he'll play e5. Problem is, if black ever plays either e5 or c5, the d5 pawn isn't defended very much. Um, so often, black will take on c4 and then play e5. It's a common idea in the Slav. Now, white took care of all that. He just played c5, which again, grandmasters today wouldn't do. And now, there's no stopping black from playing e5, and there's no pressure on the d5 pawn. The c4 pawn's gone. And there's a lot of positions in the Slav where what black plays e5 anyway, white takes on d5, and eventually, Black gets an isolated pawn. Just to show you at home, let's pretend white plays bishop e2, and we'll just cheat a little bit, okay? And after some move like e5, we could take and take, and you'll see that black has an isolated pawn here. Um, however, when white plays c5 like he did, then we just play e5 for free, and there's no stopping e5, because black's got a lot of guys on e5. Okay, so, Zucker Tort is like, okay, you can play e5, and I'm going to push on the queen side. And nowadays, most grandmasters won't play that way with white, because black gets an easy game in the center and the king side. Okay, but that's what these guys did. And he could take the pawn, he could play this variation they give, and then put the knight on d4. But again, <clears throat> black has a very easy game. In a lot of positions like this, where you see this pawn structure, which you see in a lot of Slavs and Queen's Gambit declines, the bishop on c8 is having trouble getting out, and we don't know what to do. But in this variation, the bishop's already out on a very nice diagonal, so black doesn't really have any problems. Okay, so Steinitz played bishop e2, allowing e4. <clears throat> now, if you look at one of my previous lectures, and actually, I don't know what order they're putting my lectures in, I assume by when I give them, but could be wrong. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I won the, in the last round against Nick Carlo, and even though that was a King's Indian, we had a similar pawn structure. I played d6 and e5, he let me play e4 attacking his knight, and then I played d5, and I got this pawn structure like this, and my opponent was pushing on the queen side, although he didn't play c5. Okay, so Steinitz played knight f6, gave white another chance. White didn't take it, so Steinitz played e4. And this is very interesting for the spectator, because black's pushing on the king side and center, and white's pushing on the queen side. So a draw is less likely than a decisive result. And okay, games played in the 1800s, there weren't too many draws. They didn't defend perfectly. <clears throat> Now, if any grandmaster today walks into the lecture, and I'm sure they will, they would take black here. Um, black has more space in the center, and black has all of his pieces out, and they're all pretty active. And white has more space on the queen side, but, I mean, white's king is going to be in trouble, and uh, Steinitz actually showed that to be true. Um, this was one of, well, I mean, it's the world championship match. Um, as long as you don't talk to Jacob Wilkins, you'll have a high opinion of Wilhelm Steinitz. Okay, so he played h5, which is what a grandmaster today would do, gaining space on the king's side. Black wants to gain more space, and if white ever plays h4 to block this pawn, then black has really good use of the g4 square. And if white castles, there's going to be a lot of attacking going on over here. 
um, too much attacking. Knight d2 instead of? Uh, knight h4. In this position. Well, after knight h4, I would guess I would play bishop e6. You can't play like g4. Uh, you can, but I think you're answering your own question. I mean, I don't want to play g4. Although Nick Harlow played g4 against me. How did he do? Yeah. So black's threatening g5, winning the knight. I would be more apt to play f4 here. Um, so that g5 is not possible. Yeah, I don't know. Your ideas are dangerous at best. OK, so uh, I just came from my college class that I was teaching, Tactics 101. And we were, we, I was teaching this move. Class dismissed. Yeah. All right, with an eerie silence in the room because the queen's attacking the knight. So black just wins a pawn. See, th 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 this ain't no classroom. This is a world championship match. They don't fall for that. Yeah. OK, well, I didn't seriously consider knight h4 because I was afraid of my knight, but you were gung-ho to play aggressively on the king side. So. OK, so knight to d2, Zucker tort, <clears throat> not recommended by Danny Machuka. h5, and he played h3, which the commentator said is forced. Okay, and they give some other line. B5, terrible, knight g4, queen h4, rawr. I mean, I hate to agree with annotations from 500 years ago, but I agree. I don't like white's position. Okay, well, I don't know if I, like, if I like black's position either. All right, so h3, knight f8, the knight's going over to the king's side. If I was black, probably something like that. a4, knight g6. And now uh, the commentator's recommending knight b3. <clears throat> and actually, I like the second line they give. g3, queen b8, black wants to sacrifice, recommended by Danny Machuka, okay, attacking the white king. Knight f1, queen c8 threatening the h pawn. And knight g4, and I mean, this is just terrible for white. King's going to be here forever. Rook's going to be here forever. OK, so Zucker Tort played b5. Knight went to h4. Steinitz played the way I recommended. He must have known. Well, we can't let him play knight takes g2. So OK, he played g3. I don't know if I would have played g3. Maybe. OK, and now Steinitz went crazy, which, but, but correctly, unlike certain other people who we won't mention. Well, you know, that you're a more modern player. However, then you wouldn't let your opponent sack all of his pieces. See how much fun he's having? So Steinitz, instead of retreating like a Frenchman, played knight g2 check, fianchettoing his knight. And unlike most of the moves played by players in the 1800s, in this position, Zuckertor played the computer recommended move. That joke was too complicated for this class. <laughs> King f1, right. <laughs> Now, some of you may notice the knight doesn't have a plethora of squares. That's because you don't have imagination. Knight to i3. Now, even the computer can't find it. OK, so he played knight takes e3 check. Again, the computer recommended move, f takes e3. And bishop takes g3. So this reminds me of like a Danny Machuka sacrifice, except black has sufficient compensation, for sure. Black has two pawns, which isn't enough. But h3 is weak. My rook is coming into the attack. My queen's coming into the attack. And these pieces aren't the best defenders in the world. They're close, but they're not. So this is what we call a long-term sacrifice. Black's going to attack the next 10, 15, 20 moves. And white's going to try to get his pieces next to his king. OK, good luck. And <clears throat> again, it sort of looks like a simultaneous because Players in the 1800s weren't quite as good as the best players in the world now. And sometimes, even in world championship matches, especially Steinitz Chagorin, uh, some of the moves were suspicious. Some of the games ended in 10 moves. OK, so white play king g2, I agree. <clears throat> it attacks the bishop, and it defends the pawn on h3. And it allows 
White's pieces to come defend. So King G2 seems good. Danny would probably sacrifice his bishop on G3. He's like, well, maybe. Yeah. Okay, so bishop went back to C7. That's a pretty good bishop. We need, we need to get a queen in here. Or a knight in here. Something going on. Get a rook over here. Okay, so white played queen g1, probably a move I would never consider because, you know, that seems like you're helping black play rook g6. If I was white, I would be thinking, my opponent wants to play rook h6 to g6. So queen g1 is not the first move I consider because that seems to make that better. Okay, but Zukotor had an idea. And what does the computer say? Queen f1's losing, knight f1's losing, it doesn't care, okay. It says white's losing. So queen g1, rook h6, and his idea was king f1, and maybe my king will run away. In fact, if white can play king c2, eh, that's probably okay. Then he won't get checkmated, he'll be a piece up. Okay, rook g6. Again, the computer move by Zukertor, what a fine player, because the bishop is controlling h2, we can't put our queen there. The queen is attacked, so the class will recommend F7, queen F7. Oh, mm. sorry. Uh, I knew what you meant. Yeah, queen F2. Okay, queen to D7 was played, attacking the H3 pawn. And white crashed through on the queen side. Okay, rook G1, trying to trade rooks. A good idea when you're getting checkmated. And knight G4, not trading rooks. So not only is black threatening the knight, and has pressure on the pawn on e3, Steinitz wants to play rook f6 and attack the f2 square and get more attack. So, you know, if you just walked in, and some of you did, you might think white could castle later, but no, white already moved his king all the way over here, he's gonna go over here. And with all this extra space black has, and the three pawns, and the active pieces, and the fact that these three, four pieces are just awful, uh, black should just be winning here. Okay, he took the knight, which is what I would do when I'm getting checkmated, I try to trade all the pieces off so I don't get checkmated. It's my philosophy. Bishop takes g4, not only recaptures, but it keeps white's king bottled up. White can't run away. So black has two bishops attacking. Black has three passed pawns. Black's rook is really active on g6. And this rook can go to the b file and start putting pressure here. And I don't see what these pieces are gonna do. Sort of like a Morphe lecture. Steinitz is playing like Morphe. Okay, knight to e2, excellent move. Trying to get a knight into the game. Queen e7. And again, black doesn't have to win right away to show compensation for his piece. Uh, he's gonna have compensation for the rest of the game. He's just slowly improving his position. He doesn't know if he wants to move his queen out, if his queen's gonna go here when the white queen moves away, if the rook's gonna go to f6, or if he's gonna play h4, h3, h2. In fact, that's a pretty good plan. It's a nice pass pawn. Okay, knight f4, trading more pieces, or hoping to. And he played rook h6, also could have played rook f6. Bishop c3. G5, attacking the knight, the knight retreats, and rook to f6. Now that the g file and the h file are blocked, he's trying to get his rook active somehow. Queen to g2, and rook to f3. It's a very nice move. And these are the kind of moves that are easily overlooked. I was playing an Israeli grandmaster about three years ago here in St. Louis named Viktor Mikhailovsky, and he made a similar move against me where he was white and he moved his rook to d6 and I could also take it with a minor piece but then when he takes back he's crushing me and I was like oh yeah he could just go there now when my opponent played it against me a similar move he didn't have any threats his rook was just really strong on where it was and I ended up winning the game due to incredible luck but here we're actually going to play rook takes e3 and that's really annoying if black plays rook takes e3 the game is over the knight on e2 can't be defended, and the knight on e2 is defending the bishop on c3. Also, we're getting another pawn. Four pass pawns is a lot. 
So Rook F3, you, you can't take it, but you can't leave it there. So that's why I wasn't playing this game. I got nothing to do with this game. I'm just showing it. Okay, must be pretty cool playing the first official world championship match. And having such a nice position with black. Okay, so knight f1 I think is forced. The only move to defend the pawn on e3. Again, if you take the rook, pawn takes. There's a fork here and black's gonna have too many passed pawns, too many bishops and too much material. So he played knight f1, defending his e3 pawn. So good move. And he played the move rook to b8. And again, this game reminded me a lot of Morphe because, in fact, I just gave a lecture on some of Morphe's games. Some of you were here. Uh, you at home didn't see it. Got to come to the chess club if you want to see it. And the rook is really nice on the b file, controlling all of these squares, threatening to go there later, making it hard for white's king to escape over there. And it's clearly better than on a8, where it can't move up at all. So the Morphe style of chess is not only to attack and improve your position, but to use all of your pieces. So rook b8 is a real Morphe move, because he's taking time out from attacking on the king's side and taking a rook that couldn't do anything and making it really strong, while at the same time stopping white, white from putting his rook on the b file. And again, if, you, if I show this to any modern grandmaster, I mean, they would all agree that white is completely losing here. Black has more space. Black has many more pawns. And even though white has an extra piece, his pieces can't move. His pieces are defending and basically trapped. And eventually the white king is going to pay. OK, king d2. Maybe Steinitz was white this game. He'd like to move his king. f5. And it's hard to stop that avalanche of pawns. And white played a5, a move that doesn't really help very much. Um, there's some other moves suggested. For example, knight h2 puts some pressure on black. But in the end, black's pawns are just too strong. And this is a variation they give. And the white queen is trapped. I hate when that happens. Unless I'm black, then I like it. So the bishop is controlling the diagonal. The queen has nowhere to go. And that was, uh, I guess, the main variation of white had played best, although that didn't work out very well. OK, he played a5. I, I don't really have an explanation for that move. Just waiting to lose. f4, breaking through. Now he plays rook h1. And black's not in a hurry. So white can't do anything. Rook e1. F takes e3 check. Wow, I really wouldn't want to take that, but I guess if I don't take it, rook f2 is incredibly winning. So, and he played rook f2. Another variation was rook takes e3, king takes e3, bishop f4 check. If you take the bishop, it's checkmate. But you don't have to take the bishop, you can play king f2. And I don't know, whoever annotated this game wrote king f2 exclam, although Danny Machuca can't wait to have black here. Right? There's no, maybe there's no immediate forced win, but this is just a terrible king. And even though white is up a rook, and I like being up a rook, I would still take black here. Okay, but there's no reason to sacrifice material. We don't have to. Rook, e, rook f2 is good enough. Attacking the queen. Does the queen have a safe square? Can you move the queen and save it? G8. Let's see, queen g8. I'll never stop teasing you. Never. I'll, ne I'll never stop teasing you. Yeah, I know what you meant. Yeah, queen g1. Then if I was black, I'd probably play queen f3. And then I would play bishop f4. And then they would call the police, because that should be illegal. That's, uh, they're, they're, there's good and there's not good. That's not good. OK, so instead, he played queen takes f2, sacrificing his queen to stop the attack. And then he played knight takes g4. So if black doesn't have any pieces, he won't attack so much. Good plan. And bishop f4 check. Now, this isn't just sacrificing his queen. I mean, after, well, I'm sure takes wins. This queen could get trapped in here. Rook h8 check could be annoying. 
So this isn't so simple. So bishop, bishop f4 check. You can't take the bishop because it's illegal. It's pinned. So the king has to move. And now he took back. Yeah, it's unfortunate this bishop is defending the rook. Okay. And again, resigning wasn't the big thing back then. If we go back to this position and he takes the knight right away, then the black queen doesn't have the e3 square to escape. But because he threw this check in, now if the black queen gets attacked, it has the very safe e3 square. And then d3 and the checkmate. So there's no way to trap the black queen. You can't take the bishop because the knight's pinned. Maybe there's some spite checks. Yay. Okay, so he plays bishop to d2, unpinning his knight, but okay. If this was a world championship match being played today, I would say in the last 70 years, White would resign. But this was the first world championship game ever, so we don't want to give up. So bishop d2, and Steinitz played e3. Looks pretty good. Bishop went to c1. Queen goes to g2, not to attack the rook, which is defended, but so he can play queen e4 check. And once the black queen isn't trapped, there's no reason for white to keep playing. Black has a winning material advantage. So for a world championship game, that was a pretty big crush. Um, what's funny about it is, uh, for some of you who weren't here at the beginning, uh, the person who lost this game, Zuckertort, who looks like he really got hammered, he won the next four games. So chess is tough. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. Uh, he played king c3, no resigning. King went to d7. Rook check, check again, and now there's no more checks. Oh well. Bishop takes this pawn, playing for more checks. Hey, he checked him again. Solid. And his hope, and this is, we have a name for this, the, the top players talk about this. When, when your tricks don't work, that's when you're in trouble. He's playing for a trick. If his opponent falls for the trick, he's still completely losing. Okay? The trick is, if I take the rook, then knight g3 check wins the queen. However, black is still completely winning there, so that's, that trick's not so good. Okay? And Steinitz played bishop f4, because there's no reason to lose your queen if you don't have to. Although, if he wanted to fall for the trick, then, okay, black is up two pawns, and he's still queening, so... King f3 would win pretty easily. Rook f8 is the safe move. Then there's no rook f6 check. Okay, but there's no reason to lose your queen when you don't have to. He played bishop f4. And since Steinitz didn't fall for his uh, simple trick, it was a world championship after all, uh, now white decided to resign. White's down a queen for a rook. Black has two extra pawns. And black is probably going to win more material soon. And if I was a betting man, I would guess if you put this on a chess engine, after about a minute it would announce mate. That's my guess, but I'm not sure. Now, what's interesting about this match um, is for those of you who are late again, or for those of you who don't know how to start from the beginning, uh, some of this match was played in St. Louis, probably about a mile and a half from here. Uh, down, actually, I know where it was, but I think the building's not there anymore. Down Lindell, Lindell turns into Olive, then it turns into the World Championship. And the first few games were played in New York, then they played a few games in St. Louis, and they finished the match in New Orleans. Um, and Steinitz won the match and became the first official world champion. And uh, I mean, I was surprised that before this tournament, uh, before this match, they had played in the same tournament, and Zuckertort finished in clear first, way ahead of Steinitz, who came in second. And so these seem like the two players who should play a match for the World Championship. Some people claim Zuckertort was in ill health and this wasn't his best chess, that in the 1870s and early 1880s, he would have beaten Steinitz, but they didn't play then. So, um, and in fact, Zuckertort died two years after this match from a broken heart. No. So some World Championship match games from the 1880s, 1890s weren't the best. But I like this one because it had a good flow to it. Uh, white pushed all of his queenside pawns and got nothing. And black pushed all his kingside pawns. And white's king went for a walk in both directions. And this is the kind of game you would expect to see 
if it was like Mikhail Tall versus an amateur and a simultaneous, not a world championship match because White got beaten so badly. But that happens. Sometimes you get beaten badly and losing one game isn't everything. As Zuckertor proved, he won the next few, but I think he got tired and sick in the middle and end of the match and lost the match. And because of these matches, the Alakine Capablanca match, this match, the Karpov Kasparov match from 1985, uh, nowadays, matches don't take any time at all because I think the organizers and the public and the players are afraid somebody's going to get sick. If you're playing a match that lasts two months and you're going from city to city, I mean, somebody, and, and when these matches happen that went two, three, four, five, and actually six months for the 85 match, um, it gets sort of silly. So I think a good match would be something like 18 games then you get to see who the better player is. But players nowadays and organizers, they like the 12-game format. 12 games, two, three weeks, get in, get out, you're the world champion. In, in those days, they, they last for a month, two months, and whenever somebody lost, they went, yeah, I got sick. Because, you know, it happens, it's just as tough. Right, Ben Simon? He can't even stay here for the whole thing. He has to, he's sick and then he comes back, right? If the lecture is more than 30 minutes, he's like, no. Yeah. Exactly. We have to get in just the right amount. Well, I hope you enjoyed that game. And actually, over the next few weeks, what I'm going to attempt to do, for those of you watching at home, I want to show some of these older games, not just, you know, Anand beating Topolov. Or last week, it was Topolov beating Anand. That happens. And we're going to see some of these older players you may not know a lot about. And we'll do a little Wikipedia searching and find out about the suspicious activities surrounding the match. This is Chess History World Championship match. This was the first game ever played in an official world championship, which was won by Steinitz, and the match was won by Steinitz. And we'll look at more games like this in the future. Okay, bye everyone. Yeah.